Ever since his offensive at Arras in April, British Commander-in-Chief Sir Douglas Haig has been champing at the bit to get his summer offensive going in Belgium. And this week, it happens. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to The Great War. The shift from last week to this week marks the third anniversary of the outbreak of the war. There was a lot going on in the field. On the Eastern Front, the Russian retreat had turned into a rout with many men flinging down their rifles and abandoning the fight, while in Romania, Russian and Romanian forces were themselves pushing back the Central Powers. The Kaiser made a speech reaffirming his commitment to destroy what he called British world domination, and in Flanders, the preliminary barrage for the new British offensive was in full swing. And that offensive, the Third Battle of Ypres, also known as Passchendaele, began this week. The Allies could really use a period of dry weather, since the land in Flanders floods with the summer rains. But it had rained the 29th, and the artillery barrage from 3,000 big guns had seriously damaged the local drainage system in any case, so the land was really marshy. The weather on July 31st was overcast and cloudy. Zero hour was set that day for 3.50 a.m., so the battlefield would be in darkness, and because of the clouds, the Royal Flying Corps would be unable to really play a part. As the moment came, and the creeping barrage roared to life, the men went over the top. Nine British and six French divisions went forward on a 25-kilometer front, though a world undone says it was 17 total. There were 17 more divisions in reserve. The French, under Francois Antoine, were on the left. Herbert Plumer's second army was on the right to hold Messines Ridge as a pivot for the main thrust, and that was 10 divisions of Hugh Goff's 5th Army in the center. Nearly half a million men were attacking. Opposing them were 20 divisions of the German 4th Army in four clusters, nine near the front, six behind them, two at the rear, and three further behind. So pretty much anywhere the Allies made a hole, the Germans could send up men to try and close it. Many of the British and French attackers made good progress, taking their first objectives with relative ease, and they found that a lot of the frontline German trenches had been obliterated by artillery. 136 tanks had been deployed as support for the advance to the Black Line, about two kilometers into the German positions. Only two tanks failed to reach their deployment positions at zero hour, a big change from last fall. These were Mark IVs though, not Mark Is. but tanks didn't really make much of an impact this day. The ground was terrible for them, though the tank Crusader helped the Gordon Highlanders advance to the Black Line by taking out snipers and machine gun nests, and the tank Challenger patrolled the Black Line for most of the day, wreaking havoc on the Germans. But Mark IV tanks had a top speed of around 6 kilometers per hour, and the boggy ground slowed them to a crawl and made them major targets. This day thus became, and still is, one of the worst in history for the only just-established British tank corps. Of the 52 tanks advancing with Goff's men, 22 broke down and 19 were put out of action. The most crucial point of the British 5th Army's attack was on the Gelluvelt Plateau, but the ground was terrible there and the German positions were supported by artillery on reverse slopes. But still, some gains were made, though there were reports of men sinking up to their waists in mud and falling behind the creeping barrage. But what of the German defenders? Well. The foremost trenches had been garrisoned pretty lightly, with the majority of the defenses being in great depth and kind of deployed in a checkerboard pattern, as we've seen before, that offered the strong points mutual support. Thing is, the German units would signal for artillery help, but the flares often went unseen because of the weather. So the front positions couldn't really do much to stop the assault. Still, German field guns on elevated ground to the north and south of the plateau which would have been spotted by Allied aircraft without the clouds and fog, did their deadly work. By midday, German counterattacks had tilted the battle to their favor, but much like their enemy, they had serious problems with deployment and communications. A runner sent with vital information could take several hours to cross a few thousand meters. By late afternoon, casualties were heavy on both sides, the troops were exhausted, and reserves were drying up. So the men were ordered to dig in, and the battle was ended for the moment and it began to rain again. Goff had actually achieved some sort of success. Things hadn't maybe gone so well on his right, but elsewhere the 5th Army had taken its first two objectives on time and without overwhelming casualties. In fact, 
In the first two days of the battle, they advanced more than the British had on any previous Western Front offensive. In one sector, four kilometers, and in another, three. Goff decided that his men were to try and push the Germans to the Green Line, the third objective, and another kilometer or so forward towards Polygon Wood by August 4th. But the rain fell for the remainder of the week, preventing real large-scale operations. British casualties for the 5th and 2nd Armies from July 31st to August 3rd were 31,850, including 23,000 the first day. Now, that's a lot but it's a lot fewer than from the first day of the Battle of the Somme last summer, just a bit more than half of that. Thing is, Goff's planning had proven to be pretty flawed. He hadn't driven into the German defenses nearly as far as he'd imagined he would, and there was really no chance that infantry could move as fast and as far as he wanted through the layered German positions. He certainly hadn't come near to taking Wuhlers, which was supposed to happen before the planned amphibious landing could take place, so that amphibious force just remained idle. Also, the continuing German hold of the Gelovelt Plateau negated any chance of a breakthrough. Germany, though, going back to the artillery barrage of the 21st, had taken 30,000 casualties itself, including 9,000 missing, which isn't surprising since the barrage was the heaviest ever, and a lot of those missing Germans had simply been buried alive by it. And more than 5,000 Germans were taken prisoner between July 31st and August 2nd. A side note here. German 4th Army estimated that on July 31st, its batteries fired off the equivalent of 27 ammunition trains, four times what was seen as heavy consumption at the Somme. And the Germans also had other things to worry about. On the 2nd, from the battleship Prinzlegent Luitpold at Wilhelmshaven, a stoker named Albin Kobis led a mutiny of around 400 sailors into town with cries of, down with the war. The men were persuaded to return to the ship, and there was no violence, but several hundred sailors that had attitude problems were sent to shore, and 75 were put in prison. Kerbis was sentenced to death and was executed by a firing squad in Cologne. Another sailor, who led a similar sort of action aboard the Friedrich der Grosse, was also executed. But there was now a spirit of mutiny among soldiers of both sides. In the Russian army, and its now two-week-long retreat, many men were just refusing to fight. On the 1st, Russian Prime Minister and Minister of War Alexander Kerensky replaced General Alexei Brusilov as Army Commander-in-Chief with General Lav Kornilov. Kornilov had become a hero for the nation just a few weeks ago when the Russian offensive was making great strides and Kerensky hoped this would not only raise morale in the army, but somehow stop its collapse. And at the end of the week, Chernovitz fell to the Central Powers forces. But things weren't going well for them elsewhere. The Battle of Marashti came to an end this week on August 1st, with a ringing Russian and Romanian victory over the Central Powers. In the 10 days of the battle, they had breached the enemy lines along a 35-kilometer front to a depth of 28 kilometers and had liberated some 30 villages. However, because of the Russian defeats in Galicia, much of the Russian forces were planned to soon be withdrawn to fight on their own territory, and German Field Marshal August von Mackensen planned an offensive of his own. And that was the week, an Allied victory in Romania, a continuing Russian retreat, and a new Russian army commander, a mutiny in the German Navy, and a major new Allied offensive in the West. With half a million men attacking, just a spoiler, the total forces involved in the Battle of Passchendaele would be nearly four million men. Four million men fighting each other and killing each other. That's more than the urban population of Berlin, of Madrid, of Buenos Aires. Heck, if you just count the city proper, it's more people than Los Angeles. And they were all soldiers, and they were all fighting each other day after day after day. Just think about that for a minute. I mentioned the book A World Undone by G.J. Meyer earlier. It is a fantastic book, one of my favorite books about the war, and a great source for our show. Of course, you can get it in our Amazon store by clicking the link below. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about the man behind the Third Battle of Ypres, you can click right here for our bio special about Sir Douglas Haig. Our Patreon supporter of the week is Robert Jeff the Hobo Cartwright. That is an awesome name. All right, thank you Jeff the Hobo and everybody else for your support on Patreon. We could not do this show without it. See you next time.